I'm glad that you are here today, and I do hope that you know how much God loves you. This morning we're going to continue our look through the Gospel of John. We'll be on John chapter 2, verses 13 through 25 this week, and this particular passage records for us a time when Jesus cleansed the temple. I'm going to go ahead and just jump right in and start reading in verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the words which Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men, because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. And Father, we are grateful for your love. Father, we are grateful for uh, those you've placed in our lives who encourage us, who support us, who pray for us. And Father, we pray that you'd help us as well to be that for someone else in their life, praying for them, encouraging them, supporting them in a good way, in a godly way in a fashion that honors you. We are grateful for this fellowship. We're grateful for your word, which you have kept pure and intact for us, Father God, that we might look at it, read it, study it, and learn more about you. Father, we pray you'd open our hearts and our minds to receive instruction from you today. Father, that you would remove distractions from us so that we might give you our attention. Lord, I thank you for this place. Thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I thank you for your son, Jesus, our Savior. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. At the beginning of chapter 2, John records for us the first miracle that Christ performed by turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana. And now in the second half of the chapter, John records Jesus' first public act of his ministry. Jesus goes to the temple for Passover. He cleanses the temple. He drives out the money changers and he drives out the merchants from the temple courtyard. Now the other gospels do not record this cleansing of the temple at the beginning of Christ's ministry. They do, however, record a similar event at the very close of his ministry. Matthew chapter 21 and Mark chapter 11. <clears throat> John doesn't mention that latter event. And so that causes some people to question if these might be different accounts of the same event. As I've looked at it and, and studied about it and prayed about it, I believe they are different events because I, I believe that John's intent was to supplement those synoptic gospels and to present not a different Christ, but perhaps a different perspective about Christ as he was reaching an audience a few decades later. Uh, I want to look at this passage that we have with you today in a message entitled, Making Things Right. And the first thing that I want to talk about is the corruption of the temple. And we know from the scriptures that Jesus had been to the temple many times as a boy and as a young man. Luke records in chapter 2 of his gospel that at the age of 12... Jesus went up to the temple with his family for Passover. 
His family then got ready to go back home. They lost track of Jesus somehow. They left without him, and they searched for him. And I don't know if you've ever had to do that for a child. Uh, Martha and I have experienced that with our son in Albertson years ago. Well, we knew right where to look. We went to the candy aisle, and there he was, three years old, just looking at which one he was going to stuff his pockets with. Well, that similar event in some ways happened with Jesus, but Jesus didn't go to the candy aisle of a local merchant shop. He went to the temple. He went to his father's house. And the Bible records that there he was when they found him sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening to them, answering questions, and all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. So Jesus had been to the, uh, to the temple plenty of times before this event that's recorded in John. In accordance with the Mosaic law, all Jewish men were to come to Jerusalem for three festivals every year. In Exodus chapter 23, verses 14 through 17, we see that those festivals were known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of the Harvest of First Fruits, and the Feast of the Ingathering, which was also known as the Feast of Tabernacles. The Passover holiday is linked with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Passover uh, commemorates the time when God delivered the Israelites from their bondage in Egypt. The Passover holiday is observed on the 14th day of the month of Nisan, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins on the 15th day of that same month. For Passover, a one-year-old male lamb without blemish was to be sacrificed on the afternoon of the 14th. And then that evening, a detailed family celebration was to take place. And the days began and were counted at twilight, so that was the 15th, and that marked the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that feast was a seven-day festival, and during that time, many oxen, many sheep were offered in sacrifice. Jerusalem, therefore, and the temple itself would be crowded as thousands of visitors came to celebrate Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. When you came to bring that sacrifice, that sacrifice first had to be approved before it could be offered. If the sacrifice that you brought was not without blemish, if it was deemed to be insufficient, you could buy one at the temple. So buying a lamb, buying some uh, item for sacrifice at the temple was very convenient. Uh, especially if you traveled from a long way off. You didn't have to worry about bringing that sacrifice with you as you traveled. Just buy one at the temple. But you couldn't buy one with just any kind of money. At the temple, they only accepted payment uh, in special temple coins. So it was also at this time during the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread that the temple tax was paid. The temple tax was required of Jewish males over the age of 20. You can read about that in Exodus chapter 30, verses 13 through 16. You can also read about it in Matthew chapter 17, verses 24 through 27, when Jesus is asked why don't he and his disciples pay the temple tax, and he sends Peter out to go catch a fish and take some shekels out of that fish's mouth to pay the tax. So the temple tax, when it was time for it to be paid, like buying a sacrifice at the temple, it also had to be paid for with special temple coins. So to facilitate those transactions, there were money changers at the temple. And they would provide you with the proper coins for the proper fee. So as Jesus is entering the temple courts during that year, he sees the selling of the merchandise, he sees the exchanging of money, but he doesn't just merely see merchandise and money changing taking place. He sees that there is some corruption going on. Historians have noted that the selling of those animals for sacrifice were sold at prices ten times higher than what the going rate was at the time. Not ten percent higher, but ten times higher. 
And the money changers were also charging outrageous prices to facilitate that transaction, to facilitate that exchanging of coins for those special temple coins. He comes there to the temple. He sees that they are taking advantage of those who come to worship. And not only that, but the practice has grown so large that they are occupying the outer courts of the temple with all their merchandise and all of their money-changing activities. They're occupying the space that was meant for the Gentiles to come and to worship. So instead of this being a sanctuary for believing Gentiles to come to pray and worship, it's cluttered with the hustle and the bustle of buying and selling. It's cluttered with the sights and the sounds of commerce and a busy marketplace. It was no longer a place of peace. No longer a place of refuge where a person could reverently seek the Lord. And certainly Jesus had been there before. He had seen it before. And I have no doubt that it bothered him before. But now, as he enters, he is in the first year of his public ministry. The corruption he sees makes him angry. And in his anger, he cleanses the temple. That's our second thing we want to look at today. The cleansing of the temple. As you read through those scriptures, you see that the, the Bible uses strong words to describe the actions of Jesus as He's cleansing the temple. He's driving out the sheep and the goats and those who are selling them. He turns over the tables of the money changers. He scatters the coins. Jesus was angry. And His anger causes some naysayers and some opponents of the Christian faith to point to this event and say that because of His anger that Jesus sinned. And that's just not the case. We know that Jesus never sinned. The scriptures proclaim that truth in several places. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, we read this. God made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus never sinned. And that's why he could be the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God, the Lamb without blemish who takes away the sin of the world. The Bible is clear. The wages of sin is death. And if Jesus had sinned, he would have needed to die for his sins, and he would not have been able to die for ours. Jesus never sinned, but he did demonstrate righteous anger. And anger in and of itself is not a sin. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. It tells me that yes, I'm going to be angry sometimes and I need to deal with it in an appropriate way. Being angry is not a sin. There are times when we should be angry. It makes the Lord angry when He sees people who are seeking to worship God the Father, and as they come to worship, they're being taken advantage of. It makes the Lord angry when He sees that His Father's house is being corrupted, it's being defiled. You know, my father-in-law lives right next door to us, and I can promise you that if somebody came over and they vandalized his property, if they came over and made a mess of his property, place and his property, I would be angry. But let me give you another illustration. For those of you who are married, think of the love that you have for your spouse. Now think of the emotions that you will feel if someone were to mistreat your spouse, to cheat them financially and disrupt their ability to worship the Lord. If someone is mistreating your spouse, I hope that you would become angry. See, the Lord sees that his father's house is being corrupted, it's being defiled. He sees that those who are going there to worship him are being uh, cheated, they're being taken advantage of, and he becomes angry. And being angry is not a sin. Now, certainly we're not to allow our anger to drive us to do something that is unrighteous. If we allow our anger to take us to that place, then yes, we have sin. We are to appropriately manage and channel our anger in ways 
that are right and appropriate. Jesus was angry, but he did not sin. As John noted, zeal for his father's house consumed him. Then he begins to cleanse the temple. He begins to make right that which is wrong. For him to cleanse his father's house was an entirely appropriate thing to do. Especially, though, at the time of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 14 through 15, we read about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We read about what is to take place. Verse 14, Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. But on the first day, you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Ooh, that's some strict instructions, some strict directions. And it's strict in that way because leaven in the Bible is used as a picture of sin. Says it in a couple of places that just a little bit of leaven impacts that whole loaf of bread. The scriptural command for the Feast of Unleavened Bread was for all the leaven to be removed from the house so that the, the festival, so that the commemoration, so that the acknowledgement and the remembrance of what God had done for them would be done in such a way that there was no leaven, there was no sin, just Focusing on God and His great blessings and deliverance. It was a time to commemorate and celebrate those things. That God delivers His people. And through the cleansing of the temple, Jesus was fulfilling that scripture. He was removing the leaven. He was removing the sin that was taking place. He saw uh, corruption and defilement taking place in the temple courts, and he was angry, and in his anger, he drove those people out. He cleansed the temple. And when he did, it upset the religious leaders. They confronted Jesus. They demanded a sign from him to show that he had the authority to cleanse the temple. And in his response, we see this last thing that I want to talk to you about today. We see the claim he made about the temple. Jesus, in verse 19, answered him, Destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. So they question him about what he's doing. And what I notice about that is that they wouldn't say, Hey, look, it's wrong. Stop what you're doing. You shouldn't be doing this. I think they knew that it was something that really needed to be done. But they demand a sign from Jesus to prove that he has the authority to do it. And that's when he responds, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Now some commentaries uh, suggest that Jesus might have uh, gestured to himself, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. I don't know that he necessarily patted his chest or gestured to himself. I think he just looked them all in the eyes and said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And we see that as he says that, that they believe that Jesus is speaking about the physical temple. Then they go on to tell him that, hey, you know, it's been under construction for 46 years now and you're going to do it in three days. And so... They're only thinking in earthly terms. They're only thinking in temporary type of terms. They're not thinking in regard to the heavenly, divine way that Christ is speaking to them. They think he's talking about the physical temple. And at the end of his earthly ministry, one of the charges that will be brought against Christ was that he said he would destroy the temple. You can read about that in Matthew 26 and in Mark 14. And when he died on the cross... Those who mocked Jesus as he was dying reminded him of what they deemed to be his impossible promise. Mark 15, verse 29, Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. 
Uh, Jesus was not claiming that he would destroy that physical temple, the bricks and the mortar, that he would have that destroyed, torn down, and then build it back up in three days. Could he do it? Yes. <laughs> the Lord who created all things, who upholds all things by his hands, who spoke all things into existence, certainly he could do that. But he was not talking about doing that. He wasn't talking about rebuilding the physical temple in three days. He was talking and speaking, as the scriptures tell us, about the temple of his body. And by the end of his ministry, when he had cleansed that temple for the second time, the religious leaders would be determined enough, angry enough, that they would want to destroy his body, to destroy him and his ministry. Jesus knew that they would seek to put him to death. But he also knew that they would not succeed. He fulfilled his words just as he said he would. He rose again on the third day. And when he did, John records that his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Man. This week as I studied and reflected on this passage about the cleansing of of the temple, I kept being reminded not just of all the wonderful things that, that Christ said, not just of all the wonderful things that he did, not just of his power and his authority to affect miracles in our world, but it really resonated with me about his body being the temple. And then I was reminded of what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. Our human bodies are designed to be an earthly temple for our Heavenly Father. And our temples have been corrupted by our sin. We were created in the image of God, uh, created for the glory of God, and yet we have used our mind, our will, our resources in worldly ways which dishonor our Creator. All of us, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us miss the mark. And all of us, if we seek to come to God on our own merit, if we seek to come to Him offering our own sacrifice to atone for our sin, then what we offer is insufficient. What we offer to the Lord is not without blemish, no matter how good we are, no matter how nice we are, no matter how kind we've been, no matter how much penance, uh, we have paid, penance we've paid for some of our past wrongdoings. We just cannot approach God on our own with a sacrifice that is worthy, with a sacrifice that is unblemished. Our own merit, our own worth, our own righteousness is but filthy rags unto the Lord. Anything we could ever bring is insufficient. That's why we need Christ. Because He is the perfect, unblemished Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He died for our sin. He died in our place. He paid the penalty for us that we cannot pay. And He rose again on the third day and ascended to the Father in heaven. And He makes intercession for us today. He offers forgiveness. I like the way John said it in 1 John chapter 1-9. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Christ desires to cleanse our temple. He desires to drive out those things, those practices, those beliefs, those attitudes which dishonor our Heavenly Father, which corrupt our Heavenly Father's house. He promises to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And when we give our life to Christ, when we repent of our sin, turning from sin and turning to Him, we receive salvation and the Holy Spirit, He comes to indwell us. And yet, there are times, if you're like me, you need to ask the Lord to cleanse the temple again. Lord, come in afresh. Come in anew. Lord, I know that you're there, but Lord, you know, I've, I've allowed some activities to go on over here in this area. 
Lord, I'm selling some sheep and goats at exorbitant prices over here. Lord, I'm cheating people on a little bit of what I'm giving them and what they're receiving from me. Lord, search me and find me if there be any unrighteous way in me. Lord, correct it, cleanse it, remove it, and lead me in the everlasting way. Jesus cleansed the temple more than once. The physical temple. And I think we need to reflect often and see if He needs to cleanse our temples again. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And I believe in, in the perseverance of the saints. I believe that if saved, always saved. That no one and nothing can take you out of the Father's hand. That nothing can separate you from the love of God. But every now and then we need Him to do some housekeeping. I pray that uh, you will allow Him to do that. You will give Him free reign in your life, free reign in your heart, free reign in your mind, in your business, in your hobbies, whatever pursuit you might have, whatever relationships are present in your life, that you would allow Him to lead you and guide you in all things. He promises to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He promises to make all things right. What a wonderful promise from a wonderful Savior. Would you pray for me?